Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 1st, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. For this week, Wisconsin home brewer Bob Stimsky joins us again to talk about his technique for infusing vodka with hops. Bob uses his special concoction to explore and evaluate different hop varieties and to boost the hoppiness of commercial beers and home brews alike. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And our 2012 Brewer's Logbooks are in stock and going out the door. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook is at uh, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks to everybody clicking on the amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping you to bring or helping us to bring you the... <laughs> I tried not looking at my notes this time, and it didn't work. You'll be helping us to bring you this show. We appreciate your support. Uh, we also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. You can find our iPhone and Android podcast apps on their respective stores. And we're in the BlackBerry podcast directory. And we're on the Stitcher app as well. So you can stream it uh, without downloading. There's a new episode of Basic Brewing Video out there now. In this week's show, Steve and I celebrate Leap Day by sitting on the patio and talking about what you need to have on hand to brew on the spur of the moment. We take a look at what I keep stored away, and we read some of your comments from our Facebook page. And Steve gets sniffed by a dog. <laughs> There's always a dog on Basic Brewing Video. I've got some feedback following last week's uh, audio podcast on our Brew Your Own Magazine Basic Brewing Radio collaborative experiment on uh, including kettle tube in the fermenter. This one comes from Ryan in Havertown, Pennsylvania. Ryan says, I just finished listening to the most recent episode of Basic Brewing Radio, and I wanted to comment on the results you found regarding the Trube Plus beer clearing more quickly and completely than the Trube Minus one. I found the same thing happens to me with meads. Ryan says, when I make mead, I usually ferment to a full five gallons, and then after primary fermentation slows down considerably, I'll rack the mead into five separate one-gallon fermenters to flavor with fruits, spices, herbs, etc. I will always leave at least one gallon plain, though, and I'm amazed at how the methaglins and melomels clear much more quickly than the plain mead. Even months later, Ryan says the methaglins and melomels, methaglins and melomels tend to be sparklingly clear while the plain mead still lags behind a bit. What could be going on here? Is it possible that the yeast just flocks better when there are other particles in the mead slash beer? Well, sure, I, I, I think that's definitely possible, Ryan. Very interesting to hear your results with the mead. It sounds, it sounds kind of like the yeast needs some help leaving the party, as it were. You know, those, those additional particles may be some sort of a you know, sober spouses that drag the yeast home uh, after fermentation, you know, when nothing else good can come of staying <laughs> at the party. Uh, then we have a couple of late data entries in the experiment. The first one comes from Andrew Stevenson. Andrew says, I chose to do a pre-prohibition style lager for this experiment because the lighter beer would show off the flavor difference better. This is my second attempt into the brew your own or brew in a bag world. So it has or it was an experiment all on its own. Uh, Andrew says he uh, or he split his lager in half and uh, then it did a tasting with his buddies. Two out of three uh, preferred the flavor of the beer with no trube. Andrew says the no trube beer is crisper and the trube beer tasted yeastier. Interesting. So there's a vote for no trube. Uh, our buddy Zotto Connor up in Redmond, Washington, did an Irish dry stout for St. Patty's Day. Of course, he says, for St. Patty's Day. Uh, Zot says, no real difference in fermentation times or final gravity. Zot says, the only real difference was aroma. The true beer 
had a definitive aroma and taste. He says maybe DMS. DMS is that cooked corn uh, flavor, off flavor. Uh, so that's another vote for no trube. Uh, uh, Zot did the award stabiliza uh, stabilization test. Uh, Zot says, at two days, it looked like something happened, but it might have been trube released from the bottom of the jar when I moved it to my office bookshelf. At five, it looked like a small pellicle, but it never really fermented or grew. Now it just looks like beer. Zot says, I, I never thought to smell it until I listened to the podcast last night. Actually, I wondered what to do with the jar, the seal jar. It's been in my office for a month. Looking like a misplaced urine sample, Zot says. <laughs> a misplaced urine sample. Uh, Zot says the, uh, the, the sample, the word sample, smells like Cascade with a slight acidity. But he says it, it's not, it doesn't smell bad, however. Uh, he wasn't brave enough to taste it. But uh, Zot says he's wondering if he can convince Andy Sparks to drink it at, uh, at the homebrewing conference in Seattle in June. Maybe I shouldn't have said that part. Um, <laughs> then there's this from Dan in uh, Albany, New York. Dan says, I just listened to the results on the Trube experiment, and the take-home I got from it was the same as Chris's was. It seemed to me people were describing preferences that may have had more to do with what style of beer they were brewing. I think a more appropriate experiment would be to have everyone try to do as similar recipes as possible. What needs to be realized is that the trube and the fermenter can make a difference, although slight. What we want to know is what that difference is so that we can exploit it to suit our individual taste or style of beer. I think it's a good point, but uh, here's, here's what I responded to Dan. I said, I, I think the risk, at least in the initial stage of the experiment, is this. If we said everybody brew a pale ale with this recipe... Uh, and then we came up with the results that indicate that the trube helps clear the beer and brightens the bitterness, for example. Uh, I think at that point, brewers might make the assumption that those results should be expected across the range of styles. In other words, taking that, taking that uh, result on the pale ale that everybody brewed and applied it to every other beer style on the planet. Uh, I said to Dan, by allowing participants to choose their own styles, uh, we have shown that the results are not uniformly applicable across the spectrum. Uh, I think brewers owe it to themselves to do the experiment multiple times, as I did, uh, with their favorite styles to see how it affects the beers. Um, this gives them powerful information on uh, that they've collected themselves rather than depending on experts to give them hard and fast rules. So, in other words... Uh, I know that our results from the experiment may have been a bit disappointing for those who wanted and always do this or never do that kind of rule at the end of it. However, I think it showed how complex homebrewing is and how important it is for you uh, as a homebrewer to explore on your own and make up your own always did do this or never do that rules. Um, so if you do that, if you if you try this experiment more than once on, on any given style and it's repeatable uh, and you think that it's useful information, please share it with me and I'll share it with everybody else. Uh, I think that this is a good first step, though, uh, on looking at the at how Trube affects homebrew. So I'm stepping off the stoke box now, but I, I would love to hear what you think. Drop me a line at james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Well, now let's go up north to Wisconsin to talk to Bob Stimsky about hop-infused vodka. Well, Bob Stimsky, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me, James. It's good to be here. You survived out on the lake. I have to tell you, I, t I said on the podcast, just listening to the wind on that video that you posted on our Facebook page, that was enough to keep me inside. <laughs> it it was brutal. I, I got to admit, it, it was actually fairly warm. It was like 10 degrees, but with a wind chill or a wind going about 22 miles an hour, it was minus 20. And uh, that you saw in the pictures there, that beer froze up. We were drinking ice beer, actually, by halfway through that thing. Yeah, you needed a spoon to, to get the slush out of your uh, beer glass there. It was pretty incredible. Yeah, it was. It was a good time, though. It was, it was a, kind of a poor turnout because of the cold, but... You know, I can't expect much else, you know. 
and you discovered that you're uh, you're planning ahead by mixing up your uh, iota four solution or your sanitizing solution and and keeping it into your car, <laughs> it didn't work out so well. No, I panicked there because I was ready to dump the uh, wart, and I thought, holy cow, I'll go get that thing, and it was pretty darn frozen. I couldn't get it out. And then just at that time, somebody was running it through an uh, immersion chiller, so you had hot water, and, oh, man, was that lucky. That was lucky. <laughs> you get, I had no other way of doing anything with it. <laughs> you get resourceful out there on the lake. You can. <laughs> no place to go. Literally, no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> a place to go in, in as many ways as you can think. Uh, <laughs> well, let's see, did you did you have any uh, hop infused vodka out there on the uh, on the lake? No, I I had it to take and I didn't do it. I just flat out flat out forgot. I forgot my hard boiled or my raw eggs to to boil in the mash. I just it was a rough morning, but uh, I had enough bars and everything to keep me going because you use a lot of calories and and it's that cold you know yeah 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 you mentioned you mentioned uh, in an email that you uh do soft boiled eggs in the in the mash and that's a that's quite the that's quite the concept yeah but what i do is i uh obviously clean the eggs real well and sometimes actually i put them in a little excess star sand or something but I put them in a plastic bag, a large plastic bag. I try to get as much air out as I can. And then I take them to the mash, and I try to make a little rivulet, which is kind of hard when you got a liquid. But I push them down as far as I can, gently. And then I leave my mash for the uh, 90 minutes or 60 minutes, depending on what I'm doing, if it's a hotter or a high or a low um, thing. And uh, when you take them out... After your your time's up, they're soft. I mean, they're beautiful. If you like a soft cooked egg, they are ready to go. You know, and um, it's a little tough cracking them and eating them out there and the, wherever you are. But it's uh, it's using your resources pretty well. <laughs> Stop barking, <laughs> Chris. Col- Sorry, about that. Chris Colby's got the cats and you've got the dog. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, so, she sees a squirrel, she goes crazy. So. Oh yeah, mine too. So hop hop infused vodka. I guess I guess the uh, the first question is why 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 would you infuse vodka with hops? Well, it came about serendipitously, but the the reasons I use it and I continually to do it now is um, if you have a uh, basic. Uh, lager beer that you're kind of sick of it's kind of it's okay but blah you put a little bit of uh, the hop infused vodka in there and uh, I'm not using it for the vodka part of it it's just that's the extractor but it really boosts it takes a, a regular beer and makes it into an IPA and one of the reasons I do it is that I use a different hops every time like right now I've got uh, some Sorachi Ace which I haven't used before, it has a lemon flavor. Mm. So before I tried it in a beer, I uh, extract it then, and then I'll put it in a little bit of beer, and then I'll see if I can pull out the flavors. There's supposed to be a little dill smell in there, too. I haven't really caught that, but I definitely caught the lemon. I've done it with uh, Chinook and, of course, uh, the, the, the easy ones, you know, the, the common Cascade and so on. And uh, it, it's, it comes in handy, you know. I, I like it to learn what the hops are, what they taste like. And I also like it to take a beer that even even something like a, a Guinness clone or something, you're kind of down to the end of the keg and you're kind of sick of it. You put a little in there and uh, kick it up a notch. So it's not for drinking on its own. You don't take a shot glass and, and pour yourself a shot of uh, infused vodka. Uh, no, uh, you can. I mean, we, we have done it at uh, summer summertime brew in the park, and a bunch of the guys get out there, and they say, hey, you got any uh, hot vodka? And I go, oh, yeah. And a couple of them tried it, but um, it's pretty rough going down. <laughs> it, it's rough. Now, what's rough about it? Is it, is it bitter? Yeah, it, it seems to, uh, well, I wouldn't say bitter. It, in a, technically, it should be, but maybe a harsh. It's a little mm. harsher, I think. Uh, I think you, you seem to extract a little bit more sometimes, or maybe it's just the fact that sometimes it's in the refrigerator for a month or two, mm. you know. So, but uh, we have done it. 
So what you use, uh, and I'll put a link to your website, your web page, where you uh, uh, describe the process, and you have pictures laid out, and it's nicely done. I'll put the uh, link to that in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. But you say that you, this is your technique. Uh, what inspired you to do this, first of all? Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was making, a, well, a, a apple drink. It wasn't... Apple Jack or anything on that order. I just had two gallons of fresh squeezed apple juice, and uh, I put in some distiller's yeast, which ferments up to 22%, and I thought I'd make some sort of an apple drink. Well, when I was doing some research after the, after that, I, I realized that I had all the makings for uh, Apple Jack, and it was winter, so I took it out, put it out in the deck, and within a couple of days it froze. And then when I... Uh, I used my standard fermenter with the spout, and as it started thawing out, I opened the spout and started drawing off some of the liquid, and it was very clear, and up to then it was cloudy, and I I thought, hey, you know, this could be used for clearing something, you know, that's a little bit uh, off kilter, and then I separated it. I kept the clear stuff in in like 22-ounce bottles, and then the stuff that was, eh, you know, a little cloudy, I just kept that and uh, drank it like a morning juice. It was less alcohol, almost none, maybe 5%, but it was a good drink in itself. So, uh, you know, I just started thinking, you know what, maybe I could try that with some vodka and then use that to extract the aroma because you wouldn't be extracting the bitterness because it wasn't boiled, you know, or, or steeped or whatever. Right. And uh, it it just seemed to work. And I went through a couple of different trials. I tried uh, actually um, a hop shot. I don't mm-hmm. know if anybody knows what a hop shot is. It's pure resin from, um, I think, Columbus. I'm not sure what kind of but they have. I suppose they have various kinds. But it's the pure resin. And I thought, well, this will be great. I'll just warm it up and then inject it right into the vodka. That'll separate it and so on. And it didn't work very good. Actually, it clumped up and was gooey. And uh, it, it, eventually I used it, but it didn't work. Uh, so I tried the pellets, and they, they seemed to work the best. And I did it in the French press. And um, the, the method, the way I do it is I'll take, depending on the size of the press, whether it's a small one or a large one, I'll fill it halfway. Uh, let's say it's a liter or a quart uh, size. I'll use one ounce of whatever... Um, hops I'm using, put in vodka, stir it up, leave it for 20 minutes, half hour, whatever. Keep stirring it up uh, every once in a while to to get a lot of contact. And then um, I press it out, and I use a funnel to put it into, let's say, you know, a liquor bottle or something. And then I take uh, warm water or neutral water, pour it in the same amount as the vodka, stir it up, let it sit again, and here I was just trying to get what vodka and what else residual stuff out. Well, then either, depending on what I'm kind of interested in doing, I'll, I'll leave two batches. One, um, well, let me back up a second. I, I mix these at, at this point. I, I, I have mixed. I have them both together because you want the 50-50 mm-hmm. in the bottle itself. And then uh, I'll put that bottle in the refrigerator leave it for four, five, six days, whatever, and then I take it unshaken and put it in the freezer. And the reason I put it in the refrigerator is you want the particulate matter, whatever there is, to sink to the bottom of the of the jar or glass and put it in the refrigerator, and then you put it in the freezer. And the freezer will freeze it within 24 hours or less. And I, I do loosen a cap, and I've never had a bottle explode or break, but I'm careful as to how much I fill it. And then the following day, I'll invert that bottle without the cap, of course, into a carafe or some large jar, and the vodka will start uh, dripping almost immediately. And as the vodka drips, you can actually see a yellow color going right down as it takes all the lupulins and all the other stuff. It drags it right down, and you save this stuff. This is the good stuff. You put that aside. And then you you do the same with the with the second half, and it's a little lesser quality, a little less alcohol, but nonetheless it's good. Mm. Uh, and and that you can you can just um, 
use that actually that's perfect if you got a competition or something and you don't want to have you want to have a clear beer you can put that in there and you've got no residue whatsoever now, so you actually end up with two batches, a super clear one, a little more powerful that you could use, and then another one that's a little lesser quality, but you're nonetheless good. Now, let's let's go back kind of over the steps. Uh, mm-hmm. How much vodka do you put in the uh, in the, the French press? I mean, what kind of consistency uh, are we looking at with the uh, dissolved hop pellets in there? What are we shooting for? Uh, I would say a pea soup. And it looks like it, too, to be honest, you know. Um, you know, I tried to quantify the exact amounts and everything, and I, it really comes down to whatever vessel you're going to have at the end, you know how much is in there, and you use half for vodka and half for water. Mm. So if you have a, a quart bottle that you're going to fill, you would use uh, half a quart of vodka and then, you know, subsequently uh, a half a quart of water to make your, your quart. Um, but I started off with a small French press and then I got a large one and, um, the large one I think was pretty much the standard out there. So it's like a quart or a liter and, um, one ounce and then fill it halfway with, with vodka would be about right. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's no exact way of doing it. It's kind of nebulous up in the air. You know, it's kind of by feel after the first time you've done it. You can pretty get a pretty good idea. Now you use pellet hops, but would it work with uh, whole hops as well? I would think so. I would think you'd have less uh, quantity, though. I, I haven't tried it, but you know, technically, you're just dissolving the the glands uh, mm-hmm. to get the resins out. I would think it will, I think hops or pelleted hops would be the way to go with that. Because there's a volume problem too. You put because it does swell up. Well, in in a and the, the pellets would swap the swell, swell up even better or more. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking uh, that I might try this first with my own homegrown hops, you know, just to see oh. what what character that uh, you know that my own hops have. And it seems like this would be the the best way to do it. And of course, I don't have a pelletizer, so. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, no, that sounds like a great great idea. And I've tried to I've tried to break them up in a food processor, but all that does is just uh, leave all this yellow waxy good stuff down on the blades and you know around the sides and the bottom of the of the food processor, and that's no good. Yeah, no. So how long how long do you steep the hops in the in the vodka and then in the water? I think I would add, say an average of twenty minutes to half hour, and uh, I go in a couple of times and stir it up a little bit. Is there any disadvantage I, to leaving it in there longer? No, I wouldn't think so unless there's some vegetative case that might come out of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that. I would think uh, uh, it's possible, but I've stayed within that fifteen to twenty minute. So you so you do the the first uh, the first steeping with the vodka, and then the second steeping with the the same amount of water. And you combine those two and set it in the fridge and uh, just wait until the – and what you're wanting to settle out is, is not the yellow stuff but the green clumps that are that, – that's essentially the, the leafy stuff of the, of the hops. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I get – I'm more practiced now and I don't end up with too much in the way of uh, leaf litter in there anymore. But – it's surprising how much of the yellow is floating in there. It looks just like a, a kind of a creamy color. Hmm. But after four or five days, uh, that'll settle down and turn out to be a little green sludge on the bottom. And actually, this last time with the Sriracha Ace, I had two bottles, uh, one with the, the first run and then one with the second. Um, and I was surprised that the second one, after a couple of weeks... Uh, when I brought it up and took a look at it, it had some yellow litter in the bottom of it. And this was the good stuff. This is the the, the, the first finding. So, you know, if you've got the time, you might want to let it set a little bit longer, a week, mm. 10 days. Forget about it. I had one where I actually did forget about it. Uh, I was in between the kegs, and I didn't think and it. It was a, one of the better ones, but I'm not patient, man. You know, <laughs> I'm not patient at all. Now you you use a, a glass uh, bottle in the freezer, which 
Mm-hmm. I, I, you say you haven't had any break, but I would be cautious about, especially you know you don't want to, you wouldn't want to leave the lid on that uh, while I it's can. freezing. Um, but does it get does it freeze solid at that at that half and half uh, vodka and water consistency, or does it do like one of those uh, margarita kits, you know, the bucket uh, margarita things, and just get slushy? No, it's more than slush. But yet, when you turn it over, you know, almost within seconds, you're going to see the first vodka running out of there. So I would say it's a you know ninety percent freeze, and mm-hmm. I don't think I, leaving it in the freezer any longer than the twenty four hours or so is going to make any difference. I think it's pretty well um, set on a percentage basis. Yeah, when I did the uh, the ice uh, barley wine, uh, that was a higher alcohol than the uh, than the cider that I did the, for the Applejack. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that uh, that the good stuff came out a lot quicker with the iced mm. barley wine because it was it didn't freeze as solidly as the cider did. Uh, yes. So it might be interesting to play with uh, the variations of you know whether whether more or less uh, vodka in the solution works better for you know ex- quicker extraction of that stuff or you know that's something that people could play with at home if they want to deviate from from your formula. Well, I, my formula is pretty deviated already, so I think they <laughs> they they can work off of that. It 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 is uh, kind of flying by the seat of your pants, you know. And 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 I think anybody that does it is going to have a a fun time, uh, especially trying different hops and seeing if they can really differentiate. Oh, yeah, this one does have uh, mango flavors or mm-hmm, whatever, mm-hmm. and. Uh, once you find yourself in a position where you only have some uh, mega swill at home, or you're out and you happen to have this, uh, and I don't know why, but you can make a you can make a regular everyday beer taste like a high IPA and really really jazz it up, and it's fun. I I had uh, what I consider a regular beer, the old fashioned beer, and uh, just for. Uh, giggles i poured some in there and right away it was a the perfume was up and i got oh yeah you know i could oh man it was just like a homemade homebrew you know mm. so it, it 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 it's nice to have in the refrigerator you know it's not something you have to have but it it is a good learning process for for separ- separating the different uh uh hops because i i'm not i don't have a real educated palate and I, it really does help me so how much do you have to add uh, to, say, a pint or, you know, a, a five-gallon uh, carboy? I guess it depends on your, your preference, but, but you know, what, how much do you have to add to get a, uh, you know, a good, a good impact? Well, um, I would say it, if you think of a, a shot glass, about half of a shot glass or less. You know, and, and let's say if you're just having a glass of beer, yeah, I'd say less than the mm-hmm. – well, maybe a half a, sh- a shot glass, because then you can measure it, and you can always say, "Ooh, that's too much or not enough." Mm-hmm. But uh, it a little bit goes a long way. And is the is the uh, the first runnings are the first runnings more powerful, stronger than the uh, the second, more watery runnings as far as the flavor impact goes? Yes, it's cleaner. It's cleaner. Uh, the, the, the second, the hop water, as I call it. Uh, I generally actually take that, keep it separate, and then uh, I use it to just open a keg, you know, at the end and just pour it in, you know, to, for a keg that's half gone and, you know, I'm kind of sick of it or I want to use it up. And suddenly it's like having a whole new keg of beer. You know, all of a sudden it's it's uh, it's an IPA, and before that it was a British bitter. Huh. So it's kind of like dry hopping, only wet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've used it exactly that way. I've had... Uh, beers and they're fermented and rather than throw in some hop material which gets in the way and you know and you gotta let it set a week and let it settle to the bottom and and you know and you have some problems clearing it but when you're using this method you don't have to uh, worry about any hop, hop matter you don't have to normally worry about any vegetative tastes in there i suppose if you're going for competition like i am this weekend uh putting or using this method uh, might make to a clearer beer. You know, mm. it's one thing you're, you're using a dark ale or something, it doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, you're using a cream ale and that's, you know, what, what, you, what you're going for. Uh, it might make it a lot clearer. Have you have you done, uh, I mean, I, I, you say you like Amarillo. 
Uh, have you <laughs> <laughs> have, have you played with any of the noble hop varieties uh, using this technique? Ah, no. Um, that that's one that I like to try. Um, depend, you know. Normally, you'd be using that for lagering, and um, you know, a Hallertau or uh, any of the uh, Tetanang or what. Oh, yeah, I, that'd be next step. I'll do that as soon as I get done with these Japanese <laughs> hops here. <laughs> now, but do you, after you after you get the uh, uh, the stuff uh, extracted and everything, or after you use the French press, you're not done with the hop the uh, hop residue there, the the oh. leafy stuff down on the bottom. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I missed that point. Um, I definitely scoop it out, put it in the freezer uh, in a plastic bag, and then when uh, next time I do a brew, I use that for my bittering hops. Uh, I have behind me here uh, is uh, I have an Amarillo Ale recipe, but I just changed the Amarillo Ale for Sriracha Ace. So I use the, uh, for the bittering, I use the residue hops, and I'm going to dry hop two ounces of sriracha in there next week or whenever. So uh, you don't waste anything. Because, so, you know, you're, you're, the heat extracts the bittering. And since you're not heating in this all, the bittering uh, is not extracted. It's just, um, it's just the aroma oils you're taking. So it seems to work real well. So you don't see any, uh, any difference in, in bittering uh, between, say, fresh hops and those that you've scooped out of the bottom of the... Uh, the French press. No, I, I, to be honest, you know, I haven't really uh, sat down and did a taste test with something like that. Uh, I know it's, it's nothing shocking or anything, but mm-hmm. then again, I'm a hop head and, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. And you, and, and, sure, like and surely you would, you would notice a difference if it would uh, say, for instance, if it, if it took away like half of the bitterness uh, potential of those hops, you would, you would certainly notice the impact of that. You would think. Oh, you would think so. Yeah, I know. I haven't had any uh, uh, taste differentials in anything, and I've done uh, that way maybe a dozen times with the wet hops. You know, you just put them in a baggie, uh, write the date and time and whatever, and then just seal it up and put it away. And they they'll, they'll last probably a lot longer than they will in the vacuum packed batches. You know. Hmm. Now, when you when you taste. Uh, so you you think that uh, that there's a there's a big difference? You can really taste the difference, say between an Amarillo and a Simcoe and a Cascade and and all the the varieties that you've you had. This really brings out the the character of those hops. Yeah, it separates them real well. So when you uh, you know it it might be really interesting someday. Actually, I've got enough liquor bottles around here from some reason I don't know where, but <laughs> I should actually take an Amarillo and then try a, a Simcoe and then maybe try a um, Halatau or something, you know, and, and really uh, have three different ones. And then maybe I'll use a shot glass a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. and taste a little bit of it. Because that the resin can be pretty rough. When I uh, was using the uh, hop shot um, and it didn't work very well, it, it did glump, I caught a little bit of that solid resin on my tongue yeah thinking oh that'll be nice flower <laughs> oh, oh my tongue went numb it was like i was in a movie and i had just uh cow or a, a detective movie and i just cut into a bag of white powder licked my finger and stuck it in there and then tasted the <laughs> cocaine where your your tongue goes numb and that's just what happened with that stuff it, my tongue went numb and I bet you I, I had two or three beers and i still couldn't get rid of it it was with me half a day so you want good breath, and you don't mind a little pain. You know, <laughs> a little bit of hop rot resin on your tongue goes a long way, <laughs> and it it's easy easy piercing. You know that <laughs> burns oh. a hole right through. <laughs> yes. It, yeah, I've, it's. Uh, I've I've tried that as well. I've tried. You know, I I saw the the hop resin, and I was like, huh. You know, I wonder what that tastes like. <laughs> and uh, boy, you get your answer quick. Uh, that yep. stuff is that stuff is rough. A, a little dabble, do you? As they say, yeah. And it <laughs> sticks to your tongue, do you? It isn't like you're gonna wipe it off. It's like <laughs> trying to wipe off lava or something. <laughs> you spread it's, it around. <laughs> spread it around. Hmm. <laughs> well, is there is there anything that uh, is there anything that we're missing? Is there any? Uh, are there any steps that uh, that you think that that you discovered with were, were kind of difficult to figure out or? Or anything, any more tips that you can think of? Well, 
it it just it's just like in all brewing as long as you're you're clean you're going to come out with a good product you know you can miss your temperatures on your or have a poor grind or but your beer is going to turn out fine you know and it works the same with this you just uh, use a little common sense with it but you really can't do it wrong i can't imagine how you could do it wrong unless maybe you do seal a bottle in the freezer and have a crack on you but uh I guess if you no. if, if you're extra cautious, I guess you could use like a plastic water bottle or something like that, a, like a PET bottle or. Mm-hmm. Well, the very first time I actually tried the uh, uh, vodka bottle, I have a lot of those around the house too. I must, I don't know. <laughs> but I tried it right in there, and it it did work, and I just disposed of the bottle afterwards. But it didn't. Uh, I don't know. The time I tried it, it was a little too top heavy, and it kept wanting to fall over. And I found the smaller bottle would lay straight in the craft, ah, you know, vertically. When it's upside uh, down. Yeah. Oh. But, yeah, you could use a, a plastic bottle like that and just leave the cap off. There shouldn't be any difference. I did like the, the liquor bottle more uh, because it's more tapered and it kind of focuses it where if you have a larger, wider bottle and you have it upside down, it might not be as tapered. And one of the, the things you're trying to get is – when you invert the bottle, all the sludge that's on the bottom kind of comes down and works its way down, and you don't want it to fall out. If it's thinner and spread horizontally more, it it could tend to want to mm-hmm. liquefy and go down in. I kind of like that plug. It's kind of yeah. neat. The way it goes down. And on your website, uh, you you did some really good photographs to illustrate that. Uh, so Thank you. I, I encourage uh, people, if they want to know more, to... Uh, to go on your website, follow the link on our site. Well, what's your what's your URL? It's easy to remember. Yeah, it's stemski dot com. It's s t e m p s k i dot com. And that your photo doesn't look like the video I'm seeing right now on Skype. I don't know. The, I don't but, know. <laughs> you might want to update your picture. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well, it's the only one I actually smiled in, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Well, Bob, this has been fun again, and uh, <clears throat> you're planning on we're planning on meeting up in uh, in Seattle in June, and I'm going to hold you to that. I'll be there with bells on. I'm looking forward to it. I just booked my plane yesterday. Awesome. So I'm I'm ready to go. I'm looking forward to my first one. I've been wanting to go for a long time, and I just made up my mind. I'm going, and I'm gonna. Well, we're gonna have fun, and we're gonna learn some stuff too. I bet. I bet. I'm going to be, try to get to every seminar I can. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me, James. Well, thanks again to Bob. I am definitely going to try this. Don't be surprised if you, you see it as an episode of Basic Brewing Video. I think that'll be a lot of fun. And be sure to check out Bob's site. Great information there. Bob is just, Bob's full of it, frankly. Oh, information. Full of good information. That. <laughs> Look forward to June uh, when I can meet Bob in person. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site along with our Brewer's Logbook and shirts as well along with combo deals if you go to our site. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products that this week that were purchased through the link are special effects, wire tape, and rubber band styles. And Monsters Crash the Pajama Party, Spook Show Spectacular. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. And we greatly appreciate your support. Both the small items and the big items. Like there was a like a 55-inch TV on the site uh, as well this week. Lots of stuff. Anyway, it's just amazing. Uh... Don't forget also that you can join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com as well. 
That's all. Until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website. He's provided by our buddy Kelly Dotson down in Austin, Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.